Arcturus, a huge red star. It's just bursting from inside out. The red sea of plasma on its surface rages and pulsates. The star burns anything that comes close to it. And now, flop, Arcturus is gone. But at the same moment, it reappears at the center of our solar system, replacing the sun. What we see in the sky isn't a small yellow dot anymore, but a giant red ball. It's 25 times wider and 30% heavier than the sun. Even though Arcturus is a little cooler, it's still a total nightmare for Earth. The distance from our planet to the star is now 25 times less. All the water in the oceans and rivers begins to evaporate. What used to be rainforests are quickly turning into a lifeless desert. But sunsets and sunrises now look amazing. Imagine yourself on the roof of the Empire State Building, watching the sunrise. First, you see the light over the horizon. It almost blinds you, because Arcturus is 110 times brighter than the sun. Then, the star gradually climbs over the surface. The thick dot on the horizon gets wider and wider. It continues to grow, until the red star is everything you can see. Arcturus is now so close that you can even see storms of hot plasma on its surface. There are periodic outbursts and mass ejections. Huge amounts of matter are ejected from the surface of the star at speeds of up to 1,200 miles per second. The matter takes the form of a loop attached to the star at both ends. And you have to wear a super advanced spacesuit to be able to observe such a sunrise. Life on Earth ceased to exist long ago under these conditions, and it's going to get worse over time, because every eight days, Arcturus's brilliance increases, and soon, our planet will become more like Venus. It's so close to the Sun that the high temperature makes any life there impossible. Okay, let's let our planet cool down a bit and put Proxima Centauri in the center of our solar system. It's not a red giant, but a red dwarf. This star is almost seven times smaller than the Sun and almost nine times lighter. Now our oceans and rivers are not evaporating, but freezing over. Forests and jungles are covered with snow. In about a week, there won't be a single place on Earth where the temperature is above freezing. Even plants that are used to the cold will cease to exist. They mostly feed on the sun's energy. Now, they begin to starve. But there will still be water deep beneath the ice layer. It'll be heated by the hot core of our planet. Microorganisms will still be able to survive. It's much darker on Earth, too. It's like an endless twilight here. Oh, and we can barely see the moon. The thing is, it doesn't produce its own light, but reflects it from the bright sun. With Proxima Centauri instead, the moon will lose its brightness. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. But an even bigger problem would be with our orbit. The sun has a certain gravitational force, and it keeps us just in the sweet habitable zone, where we're not too hot and not too cold. Proxima Centauri's gravity is much weaker, and Earth is slowly drifting away from the star. We now run the risk of encountering asteroids flying through space, or even other planets. But the worst case scenario is if Proxima Centauri simply can't hold our planet, and we fly away into dark space. Then, you can forget about any forms of life here. Now, let's put Sirius at the center of our solar system. It's the brightest star in our night sky. It's only 70% bigger than the sun, but almost twice as hot. So its glow is not only bright, it's sizzling. And its light is not yellow, but somewhere between blue and white. You couldn't go out in the city without sunglasses, or serious glasses. <laughs> Still, you wouldn't want to walk the streets, where the asphalt is boiling anyway. You could literally fry eggs on the curb. Of course, by this time, all life on Earth has long since disappeared. But it's not just because of the temperature. Sirius emits enormous amounts of radiation. Our atmosphere serves as a shield against the sun. But in the case of Sirius, that shield wouldn't be enough. Now, why don't we take a more bizarre approach and make ourselves a double star system. These are two stars that revolve around a common center. And there's our Earth, safe and sound. 
It's all about the size and brightness of the stars. These two aren't too big, and they give off as much light as our sun. All that matters to us is that our planet is in the safe zone of the double star system. At sunrise, you first see one star appear from below the horizon, and then, a couple of minutes later, the other. The only problem is that this beauty may soon explode with enormous force. In binary systems, one star is always heavier than its companion. Sooner or later, it starts pulling matter away from the smaller star. Gradually, the bigger star just eats its neighbor. Then the big brother can reach a critical mass and explode. This explosion would be about as strong as a supernova. It would destroy our entire solar system. The light from this explosion would be visible for hundreds of light years away. And after that, there would be a huge nebula in the place of our star system. It's stardust and particles that are left from our world. Going to the realm of the crazy now, a black hole. Yes, there's one at the center of our solar system now. We know black holes are scary, mysterious objects that pull in everything in their path. But even around a black hole, there is a habitable zone. You just have to be far enough away so that it doesn't drag you down into its black abyss. Mercury and Venus would be too close to the black hole. So most likely, they'd be torn apart and then head for the event horizon. This is the last stop before hitting the singularity, the heart of the black hole. There are only two problems, light and time. A black hole pulls light in instead of emitting it, so the Earth will quickly become dark and cold. And time goes slower around heavy objects. Near a black hole, one second can be equal to weeks or even months away in outer space. We won't feel this difference, but the entire universe around us will develop faster relative to us. Any object can become a black hole if it's compressed to a certain size. For example, the sun can become one if it's shrunk to a width of 3.7 miles. And even the Earth, if you squeeze it to a width of 0.7 inches, it becomes a black hole. Oh. Now there's some little rock lurking in the center of our solar system. It's a neutron star. It's about 18 miles wide. Some meteorites are much bigger than that. But it has a mass comparable to the Sun. So its gravitational force is about the same, and our planet's orbit is intact. But the problem is that neutron stars emit next to no visible light. So it's now permanent night on Earth. Still, it gets very hot here. When a neutron star is born, it can be several times hotter than the sun at first, but it quickly cools down to the temperature we're used to. So there's a chance that all life on Earth hasn't yet been scorched. Another problem is that these little guys are rapidly spinning and can become pulsars. It's kind of like a powerful spotlight on two sides of a spinning star. Neutron stars also eject radiation at tremendous speeds. These rays will make our planet literally sterile. No life form would be able to exist under these conditions. And now, it's time for the biggest star ever known, Stevenson 218. This red giant is 2,150 times larger than the Sun. And if we place it at the center of our solar system, its edge will lie on Saturn's orbit. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter are already swallowed by the huge star. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are roasting like chestnuts on a fire and will soon evaporate. In fact, this could happen to our sun as well. The older it gets, the redder and bigger it becomes. It'll eventually run out of its fuel, hydrogen, and the sun will start to burn heavier elements in its core. This will cause it to expand. Then we'll see more beautiful sunsets and sunrises, but the temperature will become too high. In theory, the sun will get so big that it'll swallow the Earth. And then, it'll explode in a supernova, leaving nothing of our entire solar system behind. Shiny! So, what's going on with all the news about the sun? Some say that the sun is getting angry. Well, what does that mean exactly, and should we be concerned? Frankly, yes, we should be concerned. It's generally not a good thing to get too much sunshine. The ultraviolet component of sunlight is harmful to the skin. That's why humans have adapted a spectrum of skin pigmentation. The more sunlight there is to protect ourselves against, 
the more pigmentation we need. Big floppy hats and, of course, bottles of high SPF oil-free sunscreen help too, especially for fair-skinned people. But what is planet Earth going to do? First, let's get a good estimate of just how angry the sun is likely to get. The sun usually goes through an active-calm-active cycle every 22 years, with highs and lows occurring every 11 years. Why that happens, no one knows, it just does. There's probably a reason, but scientists haven't figured it out yet. They do know that, with each cycle, the sun reverses its magnetic poles. That in itself is pretty astounding, especially when you consider that Earth hasn't reversed its magnetic poles in the last 600,000 years. Lately, the sun has been extremely calm, the calmest it's been in over a hundred years, in fact. That's unusual, too. The active-calm-active cycle has turned into an active-calm-calm cycle. But that's changing, and it's why we are notifying brightsiders about what to expect in the coming few years. The terms calm or active or angry refer to the amount of high-energy radiation that the sun gives off. Thankfully, the amount of visible light the sun gives off doesn't change very much. That would be a serious problem. If the sun were to get just 6% dimmer or brighter, the Earth would either freeze or fry. Observing sunspots is the easiest way to measure how active the sun is. The more sunspots that are visible, the more active the sun is. A graph, known as the butterfly diagram, tracks the 11-year period of sunspot activity. The butterfly diagram shows how sunspots disappear regularly from the surface of the sun and reappear regularly in other locations. NASA predicted that the present cycle of solar activity would be calm, like the previous one. But it's starting to look like that is not the case. Presently, we are in solar cycle number 25. That's the 25th 11-year solar cycle since 1755, when record-keeping began. This cycle of solar activity is expected to peak in 2025. The sun has already exceeded the number of sunspots NASA had predicted. So, it doesn't look like this solar cycle is going to be a calm one. It looks like we are going to have some very active sun-blasting radiation on Earth for the next several years. In early February 2022, 40 out of 49 SpaceX communication satellites in orbit above the atmosphere were destroyed by an explosion on the sun. High-speed electromagnetic plasma gas from the sun, known as solar wind, caused the Earth's atmosphere to compress and Elon Musk's satellites lost their orbital integrity and crashed back into Earth. Sunspots look like dark spots on the sun, but they aren't dark. They're just not as bright as the surface of the sun. To get a better idea, take a lit 25-watt light bulb and hold it in front of a lit 100-watt light bulb. The 25-watt light bulb will appear dark. That's the same way it is with sunspots. Sunspots on the surface of the sun almost always come in pairs. This is because sunspots are magnetic storms in the plasma gas of the sun. One sunspot will be magnetic positive, and the other sunspot will be magnetic negative. Between the two sunspots, which can be many times bigger than the Earth itself, there flows an electric current that carries a fiery arc of ionized gas with it. Solar flares are something else we should be concerned about. They are powerful electromagnetic explosions on the sun associated with sunspots. As the superhot plasma gas on the sun churns and twists, it also twists the magnetic field lines in the sunspots. When these lines snap, a powerful explosion releases X-ray and gamma radiation at the speed of light. Visible gases are also released. Solar flares have a classification system, according to how powerful they are. X-class solar flares are the most dangerous. This type of solar flare can cause radio blackouts across Earth and harm satellites, astronauts in orbit, and even passengers on high-altitude airplanes. M-class solar flares cause spectacular aurora at the North and South Pole areas on Earth, while C-class solar flares have almost no effect on Earth. But solar flares are not the biggest explosions on the sun. CME stands for coronal mass ejection, and these are much more massive than solar flares and more dangerous when they're headed our way. As the name indicates, coronal mass ejections are explosions that originate on the sun's corona. They hurl millions of tons of hot ionized gases outward from the corona. The word corona is derived from the Latin word for crown, and it's the layer of thin bright gas around the sun's surface. 
The corona of the sun is much hotter than the surface of the sun. The surface itself is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the corona is somewhere between 1 to 2 million degrees. The why and how the corona is so much hotter than the surface of the sun is another major mystery that scientists have yet to completely work out. A recent theory claims the corona is heated by sound waves and the sun's nuclear reactions make a lot of noise. Project GONG, which stands for Global Oscillation Networking Group, was set up on Earth to monitor the sound waves on the sun. Cool, huh? Turns out, the sun is ringing, or oscillating, like a bell. And we have five observation sites across the globe. One in India, Australia, one in the Canary Islands, one in Chile, and one in California that keep a constant watch over the 10 million sound waves moving on and around the sun. Now that the sun is entering an active phase, we can expect to see more powerful CMEs heading our way. The gases expelled by the sun are ionized and stripped of electrons by the intense heat. This causes them to form a proton storm that can travel through space at speeds of around 500 miles per second. These positively charged atomic nuclei will mostly be blocked or deflected by the magnetic field that extends around Earth. Our atmosphere is no help against a proton storm, although the last mile of air above the surface of the Earth stops the harmful X-rays from solar flares. The particle wind from the Sun can only be stopped by Earth's magnetosphere. We can look forward to some spectacular aurora around Earth's magnetic poles, and it's very possible that these aurora will extend down to the mid-latitudes when the Earth is moving through a coronal mass ejection. Currently, the United States has a space probe headed for the solar corona. Because the corona of the sun extends outward for many millions of miles, the Parker Solar Probe, as it's called, is cruising 3.8 million miles from the surface of our star, or about one-tenth the distance to Mercury. The probe is experiencing temperatures of 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is also kept at perfect room temperature. A 4.5-inch thick carbon composite heat shield protects the telescopes and magnetometers in the probe that measure the intensity of the solar wind. The five antennae that protrude into the coronal gases are made of a niobium alloy, which can withstand the extreme temperatures of the corona. The recent double calm cycle of the sun is a bit concerning when trying to predict how active the sun will get this cycle. The sunspots completely disappeared for a long time from the entire surface of the sun. It is as if the magnetic distortions we usually see on the photosphere of the sun had collapsed into its interior. Intense magnetism is coming to the surface now and breaking through into the corona. The National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado is predicting that this solar cycle, cycle number 25, will be one of the strongest ever. The last solar cycle was very calm, with a sunspot count of only 116. The average is 170. But the prediction for this cycle is between 210 and 260 sunspots, which would be one of the strongest cycles ever. We stand to lose more satellites to a stronger solar wind. We can also expect electric grid overloads as the proton storm peaks in 2025. That means we should expect an interruption to our internet services as positively charged protons get into the wires, run into the transformers, and overload them. On March 12, 1989, a powerful CME hit Earth and created absolute havoc with our power grids. Will we experience anything of this magnitude in the near future? Well, stay sharp, Brightsiders. ...of fire and smoke fly upward, and the rocket launches. The Delta IV Heavy is one of the most powerful rockets people have ever made. Three massive engines burn tons of fuel, helping the spacecraft gain altitude. The two side boosters undock, leaving the common booster core for further ascent. When in orbit, the rocket releases its payload. This is the Parker Solar Probe, the first spacecraft to touch the sun and we'll follow its journey step by step. The probe was launched on August 12, 2018 and began its journey toward our star. The sun is 93 million miles away from Earth. That's 390 times the Earth-Moon distance and 36,000 times the width of the United States from coast to coast. The particles of light that the sun emits need eight minutes to travel this distance. For our conventional rockets, that journey would take more than 200 days. But the Parker Solar Probe covered it faster, 
using gravitational maneuvers. On its way from the Earth to the Sun, the probe circled around our neighbor, Venus. All it had to do was enter the planet's gravitational field and let it attract itself. At this point, our space probe got an extra boost, and it didn't need to waste any fuel. After making one orbit, the space probe's engines changed the trajectory, and the probe left the orbit of Venus. It got enough acceleration to travel to the Sun. And on November 5, 2018, the Parker Solar Probe made its first approach to the Sun. Before touching its surface, the spacecraft had to enter the star's orbit first. To achieve this, it did even more gravitational maneuvers. Only after that did it start circling the Sun, the heaviest object in the solar system with the most powerful gravity. So, it'll give the probe an incredible amount of acceleration with each flyby. The Parker Solar Probe was constantly moving between two points. Those were the perihelion and aphelion. Look, here's the Sun, and here's the probe's orbit in the shape of an ellipse. The closest point to the Sun is the perihelion. The Sun was pulling the probe there at an incredible speed. At this point, the probe began to move away from the star. It still had a lot of speed and energy, but it was struggling against the gravitational force of the star. So it gradually slowed down. The point where the probe lost all its acceleration is called aphelion. The star's gravitational force won, and the probe began to move back toward the sun, picking up speed again. The probe made several circles following a stable orbit, but then its orbit intersected with that of Venus again. Another gravitational maneuver, and after that, the Parker Solar Probe's trajectory shifted slightly, and it gained more speed. The perihelion point of its orbit was now closer to the sun, the probe made several more circles following this new orbit. Then again, it neared Venus. Another approach to the Sun. Each encounter with Venus corrected the probe's trajectory and gradually reduced its distance from our star. In April 2021, the Parker Solar Probe finally came so close to the Sun that it touched its corona. Although the actual distance between the probe and the Sun was 5.3 million miles, that still counted as a touch. Let's look at the structure of our star by cutting it in half. This is the core of the Sun. It's about a quarter of its width. The core is 150 times as dense as water. Because of the intense pressure and high temperature, nuclear reactions occur there. Hydrogen gets converted into helium, giving off an incredible amount of heat and radiation. The next layer is the radiation zone. This is where the heat is transferred from the core to the next layers. But the photons here don't move in an outward direction. They can be directed anywhere and re-radiated many times. Scientists believe that the average time it takes a photon of light to travel from the core to the next layer of the sun is about 10,000 to 170,000 years. Then there's the convection zone. This is what's considered to be the surface of the sun. But it's not a solid surface. It's an ocean of hot plasma. It looks like a bee honeycomb. That's because the heated plasma rises from the lower layers creating something like mini geysers. And while it's still hot in the middle of those geysers, their edges cool down, creating an amazing pattern on the sun's surface. The next layers are the sun's atmosphere. First, the photosphere. This is the layer that gives off light. And that's exactly what you see when you look at the sun. But careful, don't do that. You need special equipment to look at our star. The photosphere is up to 250 miles thick. This is about the height at which the International Space Station moves above Earth. Then, the chromosphere, or the sphere of color. This layer of the sun's atmosphere gives the star its reddish hue. Solar prominences appear here. Those are powerful emissions of matter leaving the surface of the sun. Their speed can reach 430 miles per second. At some point, they get caught by the star's magnetic field and pulled back. And then there's the corona, a gaseous envelope of the sun the most powerful ejections take place there. You can see the corona during eclipses, when the moon covers the solar disk. Then you can notice some kind of glow around the star. This is the corona. It extends for millions of miles around the sun. And the Parker Solar Probe touched precisely that area. That's where solar material and radiation are still tied to the star's gravity and don't fly off into space. And all that is beyond that area is the solar wind. It's the material and radiation that managed to escape the sun's gravity and set off into space. The Parker Solar Probe surprised astronomers by providing more information about this boundary. 
It turns out, it's not a perfect circular wall like we used to think. The boundary is broken and uneven. It looks more like a mountain range. These bumpy regions have such a shape because of the uneven flow of plasma from the surface of the sun. The larger and more powerful the flow, the farther the boundary is from the star's surface. But scientists don't know yet what exactly causes this difference. After making the flyby around the sun, the Parker Solar Probe continued its journey and started to move away from the star again. Researchers are expecting another four approaches in 2022. In August 2023, the probe will make a flyby around Venus. It'll gain more speed and approach the sun at a record close distance. The next Venus flyby will happen in 2024. And hopefully, the Parker Solar Probe will be able to withstand the high temperatures and radiation so close to the sun. Luckily, scientists have taken care of that. The probe has a solar shield. It's attached to the side of the probe that will face the star. It's about the size of a house window and about four and a half inches thick. It's made of a special material that can withstand a temperature of about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's almost six times higher than the temperature of a regular kitchen oven. The body of the probe is made of a white material that reflects sunlight. All the scientific equipment is placed right in the center of the shadow of this shield. If the sun's rays hit the unprotected body of the probe at close range, all the equipment will be out of action in just a few tenths of a second. The Parker Solar Probe is equipped with the Electromagnetic Fields Investigation Instrument. This is a system for measuring electric and magnetic fields, radio waves, temperature, and plasma density. The Wide Field Imager for the Parker Solar Probe, or WISPER, is an optical telescope, the one that took those stunning images of the moving plasma in the sun's corona. These streamers are what you see during solar eclipses. The Solar Wind Electrons, Alphas, and Protons investigation measures protons, electrons, and helium ions. It helps scientists study solar winds. It often harms our technology. Unexpected flares on the surface of the sun can cause severe solar winds. They can burn chips and satellites orbiting Earth. Given that we have the ISS, where people work all the time, we need to know more about solar winds and how to protect ourselves from them. While the Parker Solar Probe continues its research, it's already set several world records. It's the closest to the sun human-made object. It's also the speed record holder. During its final approach to the sun, the probe reached a speed of 101 miles per second. That means it could cover the distance from New York to Los Angeles in just 24 seconds. And a trip around Earth would take about four minutes. A journey to the moon in such a spacecraft would only take 40 minutes. In 2025, the Parker Solar Probe will make its closest approach to the sun reaching a speed of about 430,000 miles per hour. But even this speed is only 0.064% of the speed of light.